Hi everybody, thanks for joining me once again. I am continuing to work my way through Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, one chapter at a time, and I'm about to review chapter three, which is the documentary evidence, subtitled, Were Jesus' Biographies Reliably Preserved for Us? And uh, Strobel's chapter opening anecdote this time pertains to his role in uncovering the uh, cover-up by Ford Motor Company of the fire hazard represented uh, by the Pinto in the 1970s. And Strobel actually did write a book about this, and he did play a, a significant role in uncovering this story that Pintos uh, at, during this time had a, a, a tendency to explode if, uh, <laughs> if they were impacted from behind. Strobel talks about how he found uh, confidential memos from within the Ford company that proved that the company knew that the Pinto had this uh, flaw and they deliberately chose not to correct it in order to uh, save some money and to uh, avoid having to redesign the car in a way that would shrink its uh, baggage capacity. In telling us this anecdote, Strobel stresses his responsibility as a journalist in, uh, in verifying that the, the documents he uncovered, the secret memos, were in fact uh, true and uh, authentic. And he tells us that we must take the same care to determine whether or not the documents that contain the Gospels, which he continues to refer to as the biographies of Jesus, that they are also authentic, that they have been passed down to us today from antiquity and have been preserved as they originally were. He himself asks, quote, how can I be sure that these modern-day versions bear any resemblance to what the authors originally wrote? And he also asks some other questions about the Gospels that he will uh, be attempting to handle throughout the rest of this chapter, including how can we be sure that the four Gospels are telling the whole story? Are there other biographies outside of the canonical Gospels that have been censored by the Church? And if so, how do we know that those non-canonical Gospels were not as accurate as the four that were included in the New Testament canon? And, uh, of course, the authenticity of the documents themselves is not the only important concern we must have when evaluating the Gospels, but I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more later. In this chapter, Strobel introduces us to his second expert. The first two chapters were taken up with his interview, of course, with uh, Dr. Craig Blomberg, and now he moves on to Dr. Bruce Metzger, the New Testament scholar. Uh, he's the author of dozens of books uh, about the Bible and the New Testament. One of them uh, is the New Testament, its background, growth, and content, and there are many, many others. Uh, Strobel lists his credentials. He has a master's degree from Princeton Theological Seminary. He has a master's and a doctorate from Princeton University. He was the chairman of the New Revised Standard Version Bible Committee. That was actually the Bible that I owned for, for many, many years before I kicked it old school and got a King James Version. Um, and then he, just as when he introduced uh, Blomberg to us, he spends most of a page giving us really ultimately useless uh, details about Metzger's appearance. So he describes his neatly combed white hair, his rimless eyeglasses, his obscure and austere office, quote unquote. And he puts over that Metzger has a nice sense of humor. And there's, there's actually kind of a, a funny little uh, detail that he puts in about Metzger having a, a tin in his office that contains the ashes of a copy of the revised standard version of the Bible that a, uh, a fundamentalist preacher burned in protest in uh, 1952 because he objected to Metzger using the word comrades in place of the word fellows in uh, the translation of uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9. And just on the basis of that, I, I, I say at this early part in the chapter, I kind of like this guy. Strobel also notes that Metzger has a, quote, hesitant style of speech, and he has a tendency to speak in, quote, quaint phrases, like, quite so. Okay, so maybe that's a little strange, but Metzger is in his 80s at this point when Strobel is uh, interviewing him, and he's since died. But there are worse things than having a quaint style of speech, like, for instance, uh, feigning objectivity to manipulate credulous readers into agreeing with your point of view. 
Okay, so moving on to the meat, such as it is, we have a section entitled Copies of Copies of Copies. Strobel begins his interview with uh, Metzger by pretending to be skeptical about the lack of surviving originals of New Testament documents. In fact, there are no originals of the New Testament that have survived. Not that that's particularly unusual, but just so it's out there, there's not a single original manuscript uh, of the New Testament that survives. Everything we have is uh, a copy of a copy of a copy. And he says, he asks, how can we have confidence that these copies are accurate uh, compared to the originals? So uh, Metzger replies that this isn't a unique problem to the New Testament, that there are many ancient documents that we have today that survive only through copies that are many, many generations removed from the originals. Uh, but in the favor of the New Testament, we have many, many, many copies of the Gospels, and uh, by examining those copies and cross-checking them and comparing what they have in common, we can come up with a pretty good picture of what the originals must have looked like. And adding to that authenticity is the fact that we have many copies from different regions which allows us to draw a more accurate picture of what the originals may have been. Then, prompted by Strobel, because Strobel is a very helpful interviewer, uh, Metzger also points out that uh, the, early, the age of the earliest copies, the fact that the earliest copies are relatively close to the time when it's estimated that the Gospels were originally written is important. Some of the modern copies that we have are, are old enough to have been written within a couple of generations of the estimated time of the originals being written. Um, but it's exchanges like that where Strobel prompts Medsker to add that information that makes me question if he's really serious about uh, wanting to persuade skeptics. And I've said already in this series I don't think he is, but, but he says he is. So just for the sake of argument, let's say he really does care about convincing skeptics. Then the decision to write these exchanges in this novelistic like narrative format is a really bad call because uh, it backfires on him. If he were writing a summary of Metzger's interview, or if he were even just giving us like a dry uh, edited transcript of, of Metzger's responses, it would be so much more credible because he could leave out his leading questions. You know, he, he could leave out the part where he says, oh, Dr. Metzger, what about the age of the documents? Isn't that important too? Which is pretty much what he says in the chapter. Uh, and it really only reminds us that he has no credibility as an objective journalist in this book. After that, we move to the next section, subtitled, A Mountain of Manuscripts. And Metzger, in this section, describes the huge number of surviving copies of the New Testament. He estimates well over 5,000 surviving ancient copies, ancient manuscripts of, of the New Testament. And... Uh, this is a huge number compared to the early manuscripts that we have of other documents from around that same time, like uh, the manuscripts of the works of Tacitus or Josephus. And he says there are only two surviving manuscripts of the important works of Tacitus, and there are nine manuscripts of the Jewish war by Josephus, and compare that to 5,000 copies of the New Testament. And uh, Strobel responds to this in his text, as with the phrase, quote, that was a mountain of manuscripts compared to the anthills of Tacitus and Josephus, his exclamation point, not mine. And Strobel then also claims, quote, the manuscript evidence for the New Testament was overwhelming when juxtaposed against other revered writings of antiquity. And what Strobel is referring to there, whether he realizes it or not, whether he means to refer specifically to this or not, is evidence for the existence of those documents that we now call the New Testament. Uh, that evidence may be overwhelming, but again, that is not the only thing we have to consider when evaluating the Gospels and whether or not to trust what they say. The scrap that changed history is the next section of uh, chapter 3. Uh, Strobel begins this section by asking about what the the earliest portions of the New Testament are that we still have. The earliest surviving fragment of the New Testament that we have, according to Metzger, is a, uh, a fragment of papyrus that contains a section of the Gospel of John. He, he says it has a, a portion of, the, of uh, chapter 18 of the Gospel of John. That is the earliest fragment of uh, surviving New Testament document that we have. 
And actually, he claims its discovery led scholars to shift the estimated date of the writing of the Gospel of John to earlier than what had long been assumed to be the date, the estimated date, the approximate date that it was written, which was uh, around the year 160. And instead, the discovery of this papyrus and the dating of it slid that date backwards a little bit. And now the Gospel of John, he says, uh, is dated between 100 and 150. And I think uh, the, the, the date I've heard most often is around 90. The, the Gospel of John was written around 90. I think, he, I think uh, Bart Ehrman accepts that date too. And uh, he is definitely not uh, a conservative uh, New Testament scholar. And uh, Metzger says that the discovery of this fragment overturned many scholarly opinions that questioned the reliability of the Gospel of John when it was thought to have been written much later. But is the date of its composition the only reason to question the Gospel of John's reliability? Now, from the brief discussion of that oldest surviving fragment, Strobel then moves on to asking Metzger about the oldest surviving complete or nearly complete manuscripts of the entire New Testament that we have, and that's in a section called A Wealth of Evidence. And uh, Metzger mentions the two oldest complete or nearly complete manuscripts that we currently have, and those are the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, and they both date back to around 350 AD. Those are the oldest complete New Testament documents that we have that have the, every book in the New Testament, or almost every book. Uh, Metzger puts the total number of ancient Greek manuscripts that we have at 5,664, and to that he also adds between 8,000 and 10,000 Latin Vulgates, 8,000 copies in uh, Ethiopic, Slavic, and Armenian, which added up makes a total of about 24,000 ancient surviving manuscripts altogether of the, the, the New Testament. And to Metzger, this indicates that we can have great confidence that these manuscripts are reliable copies of the originals, that the modern Bibles we have that are based on them are reliable and are accurate when compared to the originals, and also have a, a very high degree of accuracy when we compare them to the accuracy of other ancient works. At this point, Strobel breaks format again. Remember in a previous video I mentioned that he, uh, he actually leaves his interview and in that case, he cited a, a quote from William Lane Craig, and he does that again in, in this interview with Metzger, and uh, he introduces some extra evidence for Metzger's claims. This time he cites F. F. Bruce, the author of a book called The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable?, uh, who says that, in his opinion, the New Testament has better textual attestation than any other work of ancient literature. And then Strobel also cites another source, other than the expert he's interviewing, uh, the former director of the British Museum, Frederick Kenyon, who said that the interval between the original composition and the, the estimated date of the earliest surviving manuscripts of the New Testament are shorter than with any other ancient book. And then Strobel ends this section by switching to the subject of the errors in the New Testament. After all, these are copies of copies of copies by their own admissions. And uh, he says, what about, quote, what about discrepancies among the various manuscripts? Now I wanted to zero in on whether these copying mistakes have rendered our modern Bibles hopelessly riddled with inaccuracies. And let's watch breathlessly as he zeroes in. Examining the errors is the next section. Strobel and Metzger concede as I think they must, uh, that there are thousands of variations among the surviving manuscripts uh, of the, the New Testament um, due, they say, mostly to copying errors. And uh, Metzger, again, responding to a nice fat pitch of a softball question from uh, Strobel, emphasizes that these errors, even though they are numerous, uh, should not render the Gospels untrustworthy. Why is that? Well, uh, first of all, Metzger excuses the scribes for having poor eyesight because there were no eyeglasses back then, uh, lapses in memory as they were copying, as they were looking from the original to the copy that they were writing. And he also cites the fact that Greek, which is the language these earliest manuscripts were written in, is an inflected language, which means that if the scribes jumbled the word order a bit as they were copying, it was much less important than such a mistake would be in English because uh, the word order is not as important in Greek. It does not affect the meaning of the sentence. Uh, so most of those copying errors would actually be 
practically irrelevant. And despite the high number of variants in the manuscripts, Metzger says that there are no church doctrines that are imperiled by these inconsistencies, and he cites an example of this. Uh, he mentions uh, the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, which is a reference to, quote, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, which he says is missing from the earliest manuscripts, but he counters that by citing other verses in that are present in early manuscripts that refer to the Trinity, thus uh, preserving that doctrine of the Trinity. And as for the missing verses of uh, the first epistle of John, Metzger says, uh, quote, I acknowledge that it is not part of what the author of 1 John was inspired to write. Did you catch that? Did you catch two things? First, how casually, how just sort of nonchalantly he admits that a portion of the gospel had been tampered with since the original. Is that really? Yeah, it was, that's not that big of a deal. And uh, also, the, uh, he, his assertion that the author of 1 John was inspired, meaning by God, goes unremarked upon, as though that's just completely normal, we should just accept that. Yes, of course, the writer of John was inspired. Objective journalism. Strobel then breaks format for a second time, and uh, he introduces outside evidence in support of what Metzger is saying, this time by citing uh, Norman Geisler and William Nix, who claim that the New Testament has survived to modern day from antiquity in a form that is, according to them, 99.5% pure. Now, what to do with this? Well, uh, it seems to me that Strobel and Dr. Metzger have uh, left out a few important variants when they dispose of these copying errors and inconsistencies between the manuscripts. Uh, the example they cite of uh, 1 John uh, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 seems to me relatively unimportant because, as Metzger says, there's lots of references to the Trinity all throughout the New Testament that doesn't depend on this one verse. Um, especially when you consider some of the other missing pieces or inconsistencies among these manuscripts. Uh, for instance, they make no mention at all of the fact that both of the early complete manuscripts that they mention, the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, are both missing the pericope adultery, which is the uh, the story of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. I mentioned this in the last video. The pericope isn't found in any of the earlier fragments that Metzger mentions, or in any manuscript of the New Testament dated earlier than the late 4th century, and it's by far not the only verse that is missing in these early manuscripts. Uh, both the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus also lack the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark, the so-called longer ending, that even Bruce Metzger himself admits, although not in this book, uh, was not a part of the original text of Mark. The longer ending includes Mark's version of the Great Commission, which reads in Mark, quote, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Uh, the Vaticanus also lacks the passage Luke chapter 22 verses 43 and 44, which is the only passage in the Gospels that refers to the agony at Gethsemane, where Jesus uh, is praying in the garden prior to him being captured by the Romans, and he is so upset that he begins to sweat blood. Again, just like with the longer ending of Mark, Bruce Metzger himself has written that, in his opinion, this passage was added to the Gospel of Luke uh, intentionally to counter the doctrine of docetism, or the belief that Jesus was not fully human and therefore did not actually suffer while he was on earth, but only appeared to suffer. This was a, a, a debate that raged in the early church over the nature of Christ, whether he was God or man or both or some kind of uh, combination of the two. And this, uh, we'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, at the time that The Case for Christ was written, and it was first originally published in uh, 1998, Bruce Metzger had been studying the New Testament for over 60 years, and he knew about these missing verses in the oldest manuscripts. He knew that simple copying errors from inattentive scribes could not account for the 
uh, inconsistencies, the missing verses that I've just described to you, and more than those. And yet, he tells Lee Strobel emphatically that no church doctrine is affected by any of the errors or missing verses. So what to make of that? Well, the missing pericope adultery, uh, in my opinion, being it does alter the, the character of Jesus. And uh, if it were not present, it would deprive the church of one of its most famous stories about Jesus. But I suppose you could say, you could argue that, that it is not a doctrinal issue, that if it were missing, it would not fundamentally change any church doctrine. And I find it interesting that these early, very important copies of the Gospel of Mark omit the Great Commission when we now know that Mark was the first gospel uh, to be written, which we can be fairly certain of that, um, but I can let that one slide too because the Great Commission is found uh, in various forms in the other Gospels as well. It's not dependent on that passage in Mark, so that's not a doctrinal issue really either. Um, but the missing passage about the agony at Gethsemane, I, I don't think I can let that one slide. And the reason is it pertains to the nature of Jesus. Uh, Christology is what the field is called in, in the New Testament studies. And um, as I said a second ago, it's the beliefs about the nature of Jesus. Was, what was he? Was he fully human, fully divine? What? And those are most definitely matters of church doctrine. What you believe Jesus was is a matter of church doctrine. There have been schisms that have divided churches in two because they couldn't agree on what Jesus was, what his nature was. That is definitely a doctrinal issue. And in fact, um, the issue of Jesus' nature was not settled by the early church until the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451. And that's when uh, the church at that council established what was called the hypostatic union, or the doctrine of hypostasis. And that declares that Jesus had a dual nature, that he was both fully divine and fully human. And that is now uh, the dominant belief in most versions of Christianity, uh, that Jesus was both at the same time. And there's evidence throughout the Gospels for the divinity of Jesus. But the, one of the strongest indications, if not the strongest indication in the Gospels, of his full humanity, his true humanity, is that passage in Luke. Luke chapter 22, verses 43 and 44, the agony at Gethsemane, where we see that Jesus is truly suffering, as he would if he were fully human. He's not just appearing to suffer. Uh, it's not just an illusion. He's so upset that he's sweating blood and an angel comes to his side to comfort him. That's how deeply disturbed Jesus is by what is happening to him. That uh, seems to me a very important verse in if you are arguing for Jesus being fully human. Um, and by Metzger's own admission, again, elsewhere, not in anything he says to Strobel in this interview in The Case for Christ, uh, the agony at Gethsemane is missing from the oldest and most trusted manuscripts and was probably added deliberately in order to discredit the doctrine of docetism, which uh, says that Jesus was fully God but not fully man. He only appeared to be a human. And uh, I would call that putting a doctrine in jeopardy. Wouldn't you? If, you, if that verse is, is called into question, and if we can argue, as Bruce Metzger does, that <laughs> that verse of the Agony of Gethsemane was not a part of the original text, I think that calls a doctrine into question. And I think I don't like uh, Dr. Metzger as much anymore. Now we move on to another section called A High Degree of Unanimity. Metzger describes the, the, the three criteria that were used by the early church leaders when they were determining what would be in the what we now consider the New Testament canon and what would be left out. He has three criteria. First, the books must have been written by either apostles or followers of apostles. Two, the books must agree with established church practice and tradition. And three, the books had to have had uh, continuous acceptance and usage by the church at large. My problem with criterion number one is that at best we can say that it is unevenly applied in the selection of the Gospels at least. 
because as Dr. Blomberg told us in the previous chapters we've looked at, and as Dr. Metzger reminds us in the third chapter, the Gospels of Mark and Luke were written by men who were not apostles, and according to Metzger, the, the rule was they could have been written by either apostles or followers of apostles, but it seems to me the only reason to have that criteria at all is to make sure you get eyewitness testimony. And Mark and Luke were not written by eyewitnesses. Uh, they were recording not events that they saw and experienced, but they were merely recording hearsay. And Mark, which is hearsay, was the first gospel written and served as a source we now know for Matthew and also for Luke. Criterion number two does not inspire confidence in the historical authenticity of the Gospels. The requirement that all of the documents agree with church tradition would seem to disqualify any testimony that would contradict that tradition. It sort of presupposes the accuracy of the church tradition. And it would result in a canon that uh, reinforced the church's preferred narrative rather than objective history. And we've already seen through Metzger's own descriptions how early church leaders were perfectly willing to alter or to change, to introduce material into the Gospels to suit their own version of what they thought Jesus was. A canon assembled with this as one of the criteria would in positively encourage that sort of an activity. And uh, criterion three would seem to favor books that were popular not necessarily books that were true. Previously, in the, the one of the earlier chapters, Craig Blomberg noted uh, the lack of critical or contradictory testimony to the Gospel accounts. And this he cited as evidence that the Gospels are actually reliable. But Metzger's three criteria for selecting the canon, especially criteria two and three, would have encouraged the church, which were the people who were spreading these stories around the world in the first place, to disregard any such contradictory evidence or criticism if it existed. Metzger says, quote, When one studies the early history of the canon, one walks away convinced that the New Testament contains the best sources for the history of Jesus. Now, I ask you, what does it say about how certain we can be regarding the history of Jesus that according to this prolific, very well-respected New Testament scholar, the Gospels, which are not eyewitness accounts and which are rife with contradictions and inconsistencies and obvious late additions that do affect church doctrine, despite Metzger's claims to the contrary, are the best sources. Metzger then describes the non-canonical Gospels. Uh, for instance, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, I think there's also the Gospel of Judas, which isn't mentioned. Uh, Metzger describes them as all more recent and, quote, generally quite banal. The secret words of Jesus is the next section. And uh, Dr. Metzger describes the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, Strobel decides to focus on the Gospel of Thomas as uh, one of the extra canonical Gospels that some believe deserves equal consideration along with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Metzger describes the Gospel of Thomas as being written around the year 140, which would put it around 40 or 50 years after the estimated date uh, of the Gospel of John. But Metzger is giving the, the late date for the writing of Thomas because I know that some scholars uh, have estimated that it may have been written as early as 60, which would make it actually older than the Gospel of John. We don't know for sure. I know there is some debate, but uh, Metzger just flatly says, oh, it was written around 140, as though that's a, a widely agreed upon date, and apparently it is not. Uh, Metzger says that Thomas includes many familiar sayings of Jesus, but also that, quote, there are some things in Thomas that are totally alien to the canonical Gospels. And these things are uh, pantheism, and some very misogynistic teachings from Jesus, including, quote, women are not worthy of life, and Jesus' declaration that women must make themselves male if they are to enter heaven. doesn't really elaborate on how they're supposed to do that. So good luck, ladies. Metzger then says, quote, Now, this is not the Jesus we know from the four canonical Gospels. He suggests that these differences from the canonical Gospels account for why Thomas was not included in the New Testament when the early church was codifying the canon. But this only makes sense if you start with the canon. 
if you uh, examine the Gospels individually and compare them to each other, instead of comparing the canon to things outside of the canon, then there are aspects in each of the four canonical Gospels that are alien to the other three. Uh, for example, in the book of Mark, Jesus claims, he tells his disciples that he doesn't know when the world will end. That's the only place where he, he makes the claim that he is ignorant of the end of the world. Um, in uh, the book of Luke, we get the only description in the Gospels of John the Baptist leaping in his mother's womb when she came near the pregnant Mary. Um, in Matthew, we see the, the Jewish aspect of Jesus stressed much more strongly than in the other Gospels. Um, and in John, Jesus talks about himself as a divine being, whereas in uh, the other three Gospels, when Jesus refers to things like that, he's usually talking about God uh, in the third person. In John, he talks about himself in the first person in a way that we don't really see in the Synoptic Gospels. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's unique to the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John also implies a, a different timeline. The Gospel of John has Jesus having a ministry that lasts at least three years, and the Synoptic Gospels suggest, uh, although I know this can be reconciled, but they seem to imply uh, a ministry of around one year. And all of these aspects of the individual Gospels that I've mentioned are alien to the rest of the Gospels. Like the Gospel of Thomas, the four canonical Gospels have things in common with the others, and they also have elements that are unique to them that aren't found in the other Gospels. So in that respect, how is the Gospel of Thomas any different than the four canonical Gospels? Metzger says, uh, quote, I think the Gospel of Thomas is an interesting document, but it's mixed up with pantheistic and anti-feminist statements that certainly deserve to be given the left foot of fellowship, if you know what I mean. I think it's great that Metzger says that. I, I'm really glad to read that that's what the late, great, renowned New Testament scholar Bruce Metzger thought, that he believes that anti-feminist statements don't belong in the New Testament, because there's plenty of anti-feminism in the New Testament, not just in the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians, Paul teaches that women should be silent in church and be obedient. In Ephesians, Paul commands wives to submit to their husbands just as they would the Lord. In 1 Timothy, one of my favorites, women are told to dress modestly and are forbidden from teaching or usurping authority for men. And these sentiments, these anti-feminist sentiments, are uh, echoed by Peter in 1 Peter. So I suppose we can just toss these books from the canon as well, shall we? Finally, the last section of chapter 3, the unrivaled New Testament. Following the pattern that he's established in the first two chapters, Strobel, in his own voice, comments on how persuasive Metzger has been. And I suppose if you make no effort whatsoever to question him or cross-examine him, and you don't really think about anything he says, and you don't really know anything about the subject, yes, he's been quite persuasive. Uh, Strobel reiterates the fidelity of the modern New Testament to the originals, and the consensus among the early church that led to the formation of the canon. He dismisses the extra-canonical gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas and the extra-canonical epistles. And uh, in doing so, he quotes Eusebius, to declare them, quote, totally absurd and impious. Is the word impious really the sort of description that uh, would mean anything to a skeptic or an objective journalist? And then right at the end of the chapter, just as he did with Craig Blomberg, Strobel asks Dr. Metzger how his research has affected or impacted his own personal faith. And Metzger says, quote, I've asked questions all my life. I've dug into the text I've studied this thoroughly, and today I know with confidence that my trust in Jesus has been well placed. Strobel says, he paused while his eyes surveyed my face. Then he added, for emphasis, very well placed. I wonder if any of Strobel's experts will ever report that their faith has been weakened by their research. Okay, so there's something I've sort of been hinting at this whole time. 
and here it is finally, establishing the accurate transmission of the Gospels from the time of Christ when they were originally written down to today does absolutely nothing to persuade me of the truth of their claims, which seems to me is very important if you're investigating the historical Jesus. While the documents themselves may have been faithfully copied from generation to generation down these many centuries, and I actually find evidence in uh, Strobel and Metzger's own arguments that they haven't been, but let's just say they were, uh, all that means is that the modern copies of the Gospels are accurate, not that they are historically true. And there are two very good reasons why accurately transcribed Gospels does not get you any closer to true Gospels. The first reason is the source of the Gospels. Look at where they come from. By Metzger's own reckoning, the four Gospels became canon because they met certain established criteria of the early church. Among those criteria was that they were authored or assumed to have been authored by either disciples of Jesus or disciples of disciples of Jesus. Let me ask you this, would you trust a biography of L. Ron Hubbard written by David Miscavige? Would you trust a biography of David Koresh written by a member of the uh, Branch Davidians? Secondly, we have to consider the incredible nature of the claims about Jesus that we find in the Gospels. The Gospels, along with the other books of, New Testament, of the New Testament that refer to the life and the feats of Jesus, they don't merely record uh, the life and the moral philosophy of Jesus. They claim that he was literally the Son of God, that he was a miracle worker, not just a magician, but could work actual miracles. He could heal the sick with a touch, he could raise the dead, and he returned to life from his own death. These are completely unprecedented events. If these events actually happened, it's the first time they've ever happened, and they've never happened since. And the fact that the documents making these claims are very old and relatively free of copying errors when all things are considered is irrelevant. Imagine if early Mormon writings were discovered by archaeologists excavating the ruins of Salt Lake City 2,000 years into the future. And they take these relics from ancient Salt Lake City and they compare them to their most recent printings of the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and other Mormon church scriptures. And they find that they're in total agreement with their versions. Does that mean that Jesus visited North America following his crucifixion? Does that mean that Joseph Smith was visited by the angel Moroni? Does that mean that he found those golden plates and the magic stones and that they're not just crude inventions of the imagination of a shameless con artist? Of course not. Establishing that the documents containing the Gospels have been reliably preserved for us is, is all well and good. It certainly doesn't require you to take a step back. It doesn't move you any further away from making that case that the Gospels are true. Or at least it, that, that's what it would do if it were possible to establish that, which I don't think it is. Um, but unless you can make a strong case for why I should accept what those documents say as reliable history, it's a completely useless argument for persuading a skeptic to believe in the claims of Jesus and to become a Christian. So that's it for chapter three. Um, next time, chapter four, the corroborating evidence. Is there credible evidence for Jesus outside his biographies? Thank you all so much for continuing to watch these and to be interested in this and to uh, engage and join me in this. Uh, it's actually kind of fun, even though it's also exhausting, and I'm glad that so many of you are coming along, and I will see you next time. Thanks so much for watching.